how did we know in the 1970s pretty much what would happen? It was theory then. And since then, nature's been cooperating with theory, but we kind of knew what was going to happen. You couldn't add four watts of energy over every square meter and have nothing happen. The scientific consensus that CO2 will build up and will be a potential problem is very large. But a scientific consensus on precisely how influential it will be in 10 years or 20 years, what areas climates will get better, what areas will get worse, this is where the controversy comes in. We also knew that you had to stop using the atmosphere as an unpriced sewer to dump your smokestack and tailpipe waste and your land use change interactions. All of that was known. It was not just in the club of a hundred left brain people. We testified to Congress, we talked to ministers, there were national and international meetings. It was out there. Why didn't we succeed? What happened? Climate science is a system science. It's like trying to understand your body or trying to figure out something with cancer or how is the educational system going to work most effectively and how are we going to do security. Every one of these complex systems problems has multiple components. And when you break them down, what you find out is rarely do we know everything and rarely do we know nothing. So we have to break system science into the well-established components, which are settled, I'll tell you a few. Into competing explanations where our work has been able to get us to winnow it down to two or three possibilities. Here's where the disconnect comes along. Special interests will grab what's convenient for their ideology or their position. So what you end up with is you end up with a cacophony typically of people selecting stuff out of context and then you end up with the end of the world versus good for you. I'll confess my prejudice. The end of the world and good for you are the two lowest probability outcomes. What we are looking at is a multiple range of potential outcomes and what system scientists do is they winnow out the relative likelihood of these multiple outcomes. So if you try to cover it as a yes or no, and you go out there and you take a 200 scientist report like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it goes through three years of writing, two rounds of reviews, a thousand review comments on every chapter, and then two petroleum geologists, you know, who are special interest in finding oil paid by you know which oil company because they have PhDs that give an equal status in a story or on television, you see we get a little mad about that and we call that utter distortion and they say oh no that's balance it is not balance it is utter distortion because they are not reporting the relative credibility of the multiple positions and it means that you're leaving it up to the public and the political world to figure that out for themselves they're capable of it but they rarely do it how many people in this place in the fire prone california have had a house fire a few of you. Typically it's one to two percent. How many of you have fire insurance? We already are very risk averse when we have consequences that matter. We do not need 95 percent certainty. Here is where again people frame this problem by looking for exceptions to the conventional wisdom and claim until the exceptions are resolved it isn't proved and it's premature to act yet we're acting on a 1% risk and paying insurance. And here we're talking about 50% risks to the planetary life support system, and they're telling us that's not certain enough. Let's talk about tipping points. So what about Greenland? How could Greenland be a tipping point? Right now it's melting at an unprecedented rate. The water is rolling down. Nobody knows if the water is freezing on the way down or reaching the bottom. If the water makes it all the way to the bottom, then it's going to heat the bottom and lubricate it. Once you start melting it, it creates a self-fulfilling prophecy where you could move toward five meters of sea level rise and there'd be no way to stop it. What we don't know is, does it need one more degree before that happens, two or three? All I can say with high degree of confidence is the more we keep adding unprecedented levels of warming to the system, the more the number of tipping points that are going to be crossed. We know for sure they're there. We don't know for sure where they are. This is not just an academic exercise. This is something we've got to have people deeply engaged in because we're talking about the sustainability for their children, the grandchildren, and the rest of nature, our behavior. What's the worst thing about tipping points like Greenland? We will probably not know when we've crossed it for 50 years. 
So our behavior in the next generation could precondition a sustainability issue for a millennium or 10 based upon the convenience of one species for one generation. I find that a very morally daunting prospect. So what we're really doing is we're insulting our global environment at a faster rate than we're understanding it. And the best we can do, in all honesty, is say, look out, there's a chance of potentially irreversible change at a global scale based upon the benefits of use of energy. And it's very tough for us to know whether those benefits of energy today are worth the potential risks of environmental change. And we have got to take back the airwaves in a way and make certain that what's out there is more credible, not just simply following some formulaic balance. Thanks very much.